Welcome, welcome, welcome again. My Michelle Hill. Today's topic a healthy normality. This is the same book basically that we've been looking at. This is chapter 6, part 1. So I know last time we looked at the, the fanatical mind. You know, and I think so far we've been looking at, we've looked at, you know, the importance of the study of the mind, the Christian psychology, uh, the, what was it called again? Dangers in psychology, and we also looked at the influences of the mind, and last chapter, chapter 5, was the fanatical mind and now we are looking at chapter six a healthy normality so let's get right into it yes this is part one the source of true happiness well uh, let me say this the source of true happiness is basically the opposite of what you find in the fanatical mind which is chapter five just to get that just to get that out there all right there are persons with a diseased imagination to whom religion is a tyrant ruling them as with a rod of iron and kind of funny that god does say that he will rule the world with a rod of iron but we, that's probably one of the reasons why people think of God as a, what's it called again? Judge, uh, judging, non-mercy, vengeful God. Which is of course incorrect because for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believes, the, believes in, in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That doesn't sound like a vengeful, non-loving God. But people like to take things out of context, you know, so that, that can happen sometimes. But I would hope to have a conversation with those kind of people that think this way. Okay, such are constantly mourning over their depravity and groaning over supposed evil. Love does not exist in their hearts. A frown is ever upon their countenances. Have you ever looked at somebody who always looked like this? Always unhappy or always mad? Yeah, I, I can't really do that because I'm, I can't really do because I'm not really good at getting there. I rarely do that, but... So, they are chilled with the innocent laugh from the youth or from anyone. They consider all recreation or amusement a sin and think that the mind must be constantly wrought up to just such a stern, severe pitch. This is one extreme. Now, you know what? Before I even get there, let me just let me just go. At, oh wow! Now we well, we start we are starting pretty big now. Others think that the mind must ever must be ever on the stretch to invent new amusements and diversions in order to gain health. They learn to depend on excitement and are uneasy without it. Yes, we also have those kind of people out there for sure. Such are not true Christians. Well, I just said that. We, well, I, said that. I just said we do have those kinds of people out there for sure. But them, yeah, hold on. They go to another extreme. Yeah, that's what happens sometimes. 
you know, sometimes we have a we have a, 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 the easy things to do now. I no, 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 I'm not gonna say that. I can I'm 99.9999999 percent sure that the majority of the people that call themselves Christians nowadays, they would never ever dare call themselves Christians back into the first century. Like if you read, um, I think it's in Acts chapter 26 verse 11, where the first time the word Christian was mentioned at, in, at Antioch, it's a Roman, or Roman province, one of the biggest, it's like a, it's like a Dallas, Fort Worth type, or Houston, or LA, or New York City, or Chicago, or Albuquerque, or anything like any of those big cities, Denver, Colorado, like, no, yeah, or Miami, or Orlando, or things like that. Uh, or if you, if I'm gonna take, if I'm gonna take it home to my country, it's a Delma, a Paul Prince, a Cap, Cap Haitien, Pétionville, you know, that's those type of places, those type of places, basically. That's where the first, the name Christian first came out. And most people that are now calling themselves Christians, they would never want to associate themselves with that title when it first came out. Why? Because you were considered an extremist. To go Jesus Christ way was called extremist. Yep. That's actually it. So that's why when she, when she said such are not true Christians, it is easy to call yourself a Christian, but it's hard to actually live the Christian life. You know? There's a different story. Calling yourself a Christian is easy. Living the life, that's the other side of it. So, but anyways, let's move on. Let's move on. The true principles of Christianity open before all a source of happiness, the height and depth, the length and breadth of which are immeasurable. It is Christ in us, a well of water springing up into everlasting life. It is a continual wellspring from which the Christian can drink at will and never exhaust the fountain. Testimony for the Church, Volume 1, page 565. Yes, remember, oh, and page 566. Remember in John chapter 4, you know, Jesus was talking with the woman at the well, Jacob's well, and... Jesus said, give me some water to drink. And she's like, whoa, aren't you a Jew and I'm a Samaritan? Why are you asking me to drink water for to drink? Well, basically, if you knew who had asked you water to drink, you would have wanted to get water from him, basically, which is the fountain of water. So the moment we spend more time with Christ, we are never empty. You know, I was I heard somebody the other day say to her daughter that um that it's okay no it's not okay to be alone. I said no, it's okay to be alone. It's not okay to be lonely. Right? Yeah. Just so you understand. So, that was part of that. Now, let's keep on going. Zeal, which quickly fades. And I call that... What, what, what was the term again we used again? What was that term? In the fanatical mind, the first part, it's called extreme... No, no, it's called uh, extreme, excessive, excessive enthusiasm. Yes, I remember that. Excessive enthusiasm. That. We are not to encourage a spirit of enthusiasm 
Oh wow! I just tried to remember to remember the what it means to be a fan a fanaticism, which is extreme enthusiasm, and it, <laughs> that's good. I think I have some good memories. Anyways, we are not to encourage a spirit of enthusiasm that brings zeal for a while, but soon fades away, leaving discouragement and depression. We need the bread of life that comes down from heaven to give life to the soul. Study the word of God. Do not be controlled by feeling. By feeling. All who labor in the vineyard of the Lord must learn that feeling is not faith. I'm going to come back to that. To be always in a state of elevation is not required, but it is required that we have firm faith in the word of God as the flesh and blood of Christ. Letter 17, 1902. So nowadays what we do have is a bunch of feeling based lifestyle. I feel like, but to me I feel like, I feel like, I mean, no, 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 no. It's not about how you feel because how you feel doesn't mix it, doesn't make it reality. Because when reality hits, whatever you feel, if it's not according to reality, it means nothing. Same for your spiritual life. You can feel how you can feel that you can you can live that kind of lifestyle and expect to be saved. The Bible says no. It's the rule is the rule. You're not gonna live your devilish lifestyle, and of course I'm talking to myself as well, and expect to be saved. You need to be you need to repent, ask for forgiveness, and stay away from that kind of lifestyle. James 4 verse 7, submit yourself unto God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So, don't forget that. Let's keep on going. Never cold orthodoxy, nor careless liberalism. The progress of reform depends upon a clear recognition of fundamental truth. While on, the, while, on the other hand, danger lurks in a narrow philosophy and a hard, cold orthodoxy. On the other hand, there is great danger in careless liberalism. The foundation of all enduring reform is the law of God. We are to present in clear, distinct lines the need of obeying this law. Its principles must be kept before the people. They are as everlasting and inexorable as God himself. So basically, oh, the ministry of healing, page 129. So basically, like God says in Malachi chapter, no, was that Malachi? No, yes, Malachi chapter 4 verse 3, you know, I the Lord, I change not. Well, guess what? God doesn't change, so his laws are not going to change. It's that simple. I think we're going to end right here, actually. Let me see. Can I end right here? Um, yes, I'm going to end right there. Okay. So, now let me actually explain what I just said. Think of you as a parent if you are a parent, or if you're a teacher, or anything like that, that, that actually, that is supposed to be um, responsible for the care of younger, younger, your younger self. You know? I call those little children younger myself, in the sense of, I'm trying to see if I can relate to them, so I can help them understand what it means to not do certain things, but, um, so, you have a rule, let's say you're a teacher, you're um, a director or anything like that, that you make rules, okay? And your rule in your classroom is one, respect, and two, stay, stay in your seat. Now, what happens is, 
if you change over time, if you change, then your rules change. But if you don't change, if you still hold the same mentality that you need to respect yourself and respect others and you need to stay in your seat, if you still hold that same mentality, then those rules are not going to change either. So when God says, I the Lord, I change not, it also means my Ten Commandments, oh, not my Ten Commandments, well, we call it Ten Commandments the um, laws for dummies, because we didn't know what it means to love, basically. So God says, the Ten Commandments that, I given, that I've given you, still the same from Exodus, all the way down to Isaiah chapter 66, all the way to Matthew chapter 2, verse 27, 28, oops, all the way down to um, Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, doesn't change. So only people are actually saying that uh, God, God's law has changed. No, there is no change in God's law. You know, there is no change in God's law. The law is the same. This is the only thing that we as, now I'm going to speak for my people only, we as Seventh-day Adventists, Bible-believing Christians, these are the only thing that we should be happy to be called extremists. Because we want to keep God's commandment, if they call or if they call you an extremist or a fundamentalist, good. Because you are not doing man's will, but God's will. That's how it goes. That's how they call Jesus also a basically an extremist because the way he was keeping the Sabbath, especially, the Pharisees didn't like it. Because they were, their power were basically being take, their powers were being taken away from them because the people were looking up to Jesus Christ now. So, the reason why many people cannot look unto us, Seventh Day Adventist, Bible believing students, and Christians, because we are not following God closely. I'm speaking in terms of the Ten Commandments only, not anything else, just that part. So, I'm going to stop right here, actually. This is Chapter 6, Healthy Normality, Part 1. So, guys, I thank you guys for watching. And I'm gonna put a, a card up there if you want to if you want to go back to some of my previous videos there will be a card up there or up there either one of them and um, where you can watch the the previous video that I've posted already now what I'm gonna say is I hope to see you guys again <laughs> but if I don't see you guys again I hope to see you guys when Jesus Christ comes the second time. Until then, bye for now.